So anyway, I'm flying along and I'm just, I'm just stoked. And I was, you know, you hear this thing about Akashic Records, but I was seeing these formulas and diagrams and geometry and just pages just coming flying by, like you're, you know, spinning the dial on a, um, a on a library search uh, card, you know, the the old microfiche. And I was just seeing pages and pages, of, and, and I would test it. I'd say, well, what about this physics thing with accelerate? And it just pages come up, fly by, and 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 the Akashic Records is real. It's this universal mind, uh, all the information you ever want uh, about anything going on here on Earth. Um, it's all stored there, and you know, once we dump these Earth suits, we've got access to it, and I can absolutely validate that. I sent you a link to my experience that I had um, in an ayahuasca ceremony, and it lit me up. It just changed my entire perspective and validated and confirmed everything that I already kind of knew and believed. Um, and ever since, like, Spirit has just been nudging me to to just start a podcast, just start a podcast, just talk about this with others who have had the same experiences. You know, there can never be enough platforms for this, for the message to get out. And uh, that's why I'm doing this. That's awesome, bro. Congratulations. Thanks. You know, uh, you know what happens with the with the ayahuasca is it opens up that, you know, there's David and then there's your soul and then there's your higher self and even higher realm from that. And it opens up your perception to all of those. And the higher self can step forward and say, dude, you're in good hands. And, you know, we call that God a lot of times. Um, or it is God. And, you know, that was, you needed it. And it's I, cool. I, you know what? Spirit knows exactly what you need. So let's get into your NDE. What happened? So uh, it was 1994. I was working as a firefighter in Santa Barbara. Uh, I worked at uh, on a paramedic engine in um, Station 11. I was a, I drove the engine, and we went to a um, you know there was a, a a kind of a flu epidemic going on, and you know that's we had bad flu years, and every three, four, five years we'd have a bad one, and this was a bad one, and so we were running lots of calls on people that were hurting, needed to go to the hospital. And one of them was um, this lady. And uh, we showed up at her apartment and the neighbors were like, she's in there. We haven't seen her in days, but, you know, her car's there. The mail's backing up. So we kicked the door in and found her in the back. And uh, it was a good thing they called. And, um, you know, and before, so before we get, before we go any further, the a big part of my NDE was the week before, um, I was, you, you and I were just talking before that, um, you, ha you have this thing that happens sometimes you get this uh, presence. And what I had was it came in on the left side and it was really persistent all week. And it was a voice and it was a sweet voice. It wasn't a voice of doom. And it was over and over. You need to get ready. And I'd be like, Really? And it was like, you need to get ready for a change. And it, it wasn't, a, you know, again, it wasn't, a, a, you know, you're doomed or anything like that. It was, it, it's just a change. It's not a bad thing. And I heard it several times. And so I said, okay, yeah, I'll, I'll get my, you know, affairs in order, I guess. Did you question the voice? Were you, was it noticeably different than like just a thought happening in your mind. You know, we have thoughts all day. Was it right. was it noticeably different like whoa, what was that? It or was, was it <laughs> It was whoa, what was that? It it was its own uh personality. It was almost like somebody walking up behind you and saying uh by the way, did you consider this, you know? Wow. And but nobody was there. And that's a, you know, that's a common thing. A woman did this whole study on it. It comes in on the left and uh, it's like somebody putting their hand on your shoulder and 
giving you some advice. And, um, and it was, I, I had, it was really clear and, you know, I loved up my wife and took her to dinner and I ran the dogs, you know, got them out on some windswept uh, ridge, told them how much I loved them, you know, and hugged them up. And, um, you know, we got nieces and nephews. I took them to the show and took them out to lunch and uh, just sat there. The, the, the most striking thing was sitting in the theater in the dark, looking at my nieces watching The Lion King, those sweet angelic faces you know they were four or five years old and I just had tears I just had uh, and I just had this really powerful appreciation of uh, my life it was uh, all the sweet parts of you know being Bill and it was it was cool and then at the end of the week we went on this we went on this call she was in a back bedroom and she was circling the drain her vitals were just gone and so my job was to get a O2 mask on her, I slid across the bed and got right over her face and got it, you know, high flow oxygen. And she kind of woke up because we were all around her and let out this big sigh of relief. She was really happy that the fire department had showed up and the medics had showed up. And I was taking a breath in and she let a breath out and it went, you know, I took her hot breath right I could feel it fill both lungs. And <laughs> I looked at the, everybody saw it. And I'm like, this is, this is not going to go well. <laughs> and, but we got her to the hospital and she came home in a week or so. And it was a save. And so that was cool. And, but a couple of days later, I mean, I started getting sick that night. And then a couple of days later, I was like, just like her. I was really dehydrated. I was hunched over, dark. I lost a whole bunch of water weight um because i was throwing up and going the other way and i had very little um you know moisture left in me um i was cramping and it was hard to it's hard to do a lot of things and and my vitals were going nuts i had a heart rate of um 150 and beats per minute and then my blood pressure normally it's 120 over 80 uh and it was in the 70s uh, I couldn't get a radial pulse, so I knew the systolic was um, below 80, and you're not going to be um, upright and conscious very long when you, with a blood pressure like that. And so I called for help, and my family came, and so I ended up in, a, in an ambulance and got some IV started, got to the hospital. Um, emergency room was full of people um, sick. It was, it was that bad. And I got in a back bed, a back room and, you know, there were kids that were sick and stuff. So I was down, you know, I was this healthy guy in his thirties. So I was down um, the um, list of ways for getting treatment and to, to kind of hold things over. The nurse came in and, and I was feeling way better. My friends were there. My wife was there and I was feeling way better, but she came in and she said, doctors ordered this for everybody. Um, it was something for pain and something for nausea. And I, I tried to um, not have it because I was, I was like, you know, I can probably go home. I've had a couple bags, you know, I've gotten um, rehydrated sl somewhat. And she said, nope, you know, be nice, do what you're told. And I'm like, okay, you know, I, was a, I was a good soldier. <laughs> and she pushed it in the, you know, the IV has a, um, an injection port. And she pushed it all in at once. And, you know, normally you count those in over a couple of minutes. And my wife said, that plunger went in and you went down <laughs> that that fast. And she said, your eyes rolled back and you fell straight back on the bed. And you were gone. And that freaked them out. And they came in and they Narcan'd you immediately. And they Narcan'd you uh, three times to, it was a, a synthetic morphine. And, you know, to, to um, obliterate that. And that's what Narcan does. It, it works incredibly fast. Uh, and they couldn't get you back. She said the highest blood pressure she heard was 40 over zero. And uh, so they had you in a head down and had, you know, um, two large bore IVs going. And shipped you up to intensive care. And... Um, and I was up there for hours with this super low 
blood pressure. And, uh, you know, at the time I was this crazy triathlete and, you know, I'd swim before work and run at noon and ride the bike, you know, in the station. And I was working out, I was doing like a two Ironmans a week in training. And then, uh, you know, and then I would, you know, taper and and go to an event. And uh, that went on for years. And that's what, you know, because the doctors were like, I don't know how you got through the night, but, you know, I had this system that could perfuse um, what little oxygen was, was there. It could, it could push it into where it was needed. And, you know, during that night, it's the brain pretty much is the only thing that's going to need oxygen. Everything else can take a break for some time. So it was enough to, to get through. And um, so, yeah, at 3.30 in the afternoon, that's the last I remember of anything. And the next thing I uh, saw, the next thing I experienced was I was flying through this field of stars, just these giant colored balls, uh, these orbs. Um, and I just felt incredible. I felt euphoric, um, ecstatic, uh, like I'd been let out of a hot, dark, stuffy closet that I'd been stuck in. And I was just huge, expanded cloud of awareness, just flying through these stars. And it was all uh, just these wonderful um, high vibe emotions and color and light and music. It was just this flow. And, you know, when I, when I say that, a lot of people say, yeah, you know, the other side is light and color and high emotions and music and this flow. And it's all the same thing. And we're part of it. And we can't understand that. We can't begin to understand that. But um, so anyway, I'm flying along and I'm just I'm just stoked. And I was, you know, you hear this thing about Akashic Records, but I was seeing these formulas and diagrams and geometry and just pages just coming flying by. Like you're, you know, spinning the dial on a, um, a on a library search uh, card, you know, the the old microfish, and I was just seeing pages and pages, of, and and I would test it. I'd say, well, what about this physics thing with accelerate? And it just pages come up, fly by, and wow. and and the Akashic Records is real. It's this universal mind, uh, all the information you ever want uh, about anything going on here on Earth. Um, it's all stored there, and you know, once we dump these Earth suits, we've got access to it, and I can absolutely validate that because I didn't know what it was at the time. It, I just knew there was all this information flying by. Did you have a body at the time when you were flying? Did could, did you look down and like see your body? I never looked down to see what I was. It there was a, it was a seamless transition. I I was still me. I absolutely knew who I was. I had the same sort of uh, playful, mischievous sense of humor. I was absolutely me, and um, and but I was somewhere else. I was this huge expanded cloud, this giant balloon flying through space, and I knew I was really expanded because every atom felt like it was just being tickled. You know, everything, like every cell was giggling. It was just, it was just so light and wonderful. And, you know, everything about this place, we have, we have all these emotions that are these um, low end emotions like um, jealousy and um, hatred and rage and, you know, a lot of things. And they, they don't exist. They're just here for us to play with, for us to learn from. But when you unload that package, that lower end, it is so amazing. It's, it's, that's why indie ears, when they, you know, have the opportunity, a lot of them, when they have the opportunity to um, not come back, they're like, I'm not going back. There's no way. You know, and they a lot of them argue about coming back, and um, 
it's the the release of all that baggage. It's it's emotional baggage um, through the our current lifetime, or it could be many lifetimes. Um, Eckhart Tolle talks about this thing, the pain body, and you know that's that's what it is. You're unloading that. Yep. You know, all those, all those little traumas that uh, just, uh, you know, knocked you for a loop at some point in life. So, yeah, I'm flying along and it was absolutely euphoric. And I've said, I've used this term every time I told the story because I didn't want to short um, shortchange it. But it was very sensual. It was very sexual. It felt like some kind of cosmic orgasm. and like I said, every cell was giggling, like I was being tickled um, in this huge expanded awareness. Um, and but the biggest thing that was that was in my uh, thoughts, I was really perplexed. It was like, how in the world did I forget who I really was? Mm-hmm. How is it that I was convinced that I was this person, this dude, this single, this separate? Um, who had all these, you know, judgments and he had all these likes and dislikes and how he felt about this and who was cool and who wasn't because none of that was with me anymore. It was like a, a bucket. We could call that bucket bill and the bucket was just emptied out. And the whole thing, Bill's the personality and, you know, all of that was gone. And then there was this core essence or whatever of what I was, what we all are, was there and it was completely clean and absolutely euphoric. Um, so I was flying along and I was like, this is awesome. I could do this forever. And uh, then all of a sudden I landed. I landed in a place that was solid. There was indirect lighting and there were tables there and equipment hanging from the uh, walls and from the ceiling. And there were beds and and things like that. And there were beings there. There were these three short little hooded guys and they were standing right in front of me. And they had these dumpy little bodies and um, they looked exactly like those um, beings in the movie Communion. And uh, I know that people think that's a horror movie and there's some kind of demons or something, but you know, watch it again and turn the sound off because, you know, some of those soundtracks can promote fear and it, it just, it gets us running down that road. But those guys are not doing anything menacing. They're not doing anything fearful. They're, um, they're fun. They're fun loving. You know, Christopher Walken's in that movie. He's in that facility and he's dancing with these guys. He's high-fiving them, um, all kinds of, uh, funny joyful stuff i haven't seen that movie what what are they in the movie are they spiritual beings and what is communion about well they don't nobody says and a lot of people believe that it's a alien abduction that they're aliens okay Uh, but you know i'm gonna go on and talk about this taller guy um that was also there in the background but that movie that scene where you know, near the end of the movie, he gets his gets control of his fear and he goes looking for answers and he finds this thing in the field, this big uh, ball of light, and he goes into this light. And, you know, you can see a spaceship if you want to, but he doesn't walk into a spaceship. He walks into the light. Uh-huh. And, you know, in the light is another dimension and... uh he moves into this other dimension where, you know, I think this is what the whole alien abduction thing is. You know, we're, we're cared for our, um, you know, we're here on a journey and our lives are, um, you know, we're upgraded and maybe our minds changed. Um, but, and, and when I think you, and, and I, you know, I've done the alien, I've seen this before in, uh, when I go to bed and stuff. And um, when I find myself there, I always relax. I let them do their work. And um, 
it's nothing to be fearful of. And I think when you when you start to um, climb out of this place, it's something about the quality of your core. You've risen to a, a place where the illusion doesn't work for you anymore. And and this is what these abductees are. They're they they're advanced souls. And so you've you've seen. You you've had this experience where you've seen beings come in and work on you. I have uh, found myself in um, another place on um, you know like beds and things like that, and they've been around me and they've had interesting equipment. They're always very friendly and helpful, and they, but they have work to do. And a couple of times I sat up and I asked them to show me things and. Um, they would look. They, they look like the the character E.T., which was popular, I think, in the '90s, and um, they look just like that. And I asked these guys, "Can I see that? What what you're doing with that?" It was a this equipment thing, and they all looked at the guy at the head. So there was a you know, there's a guy that's in charge, and he sort of said, "Yeah, that's cool." And they showed me this for a while, and they go, "All right, we got to, you know, that's it." And um, was this after your NDE that you had this experience or before your NDE? Had you- yeah, the interesting thing was I had – I've always had these experiences where I'm in a dream and I'm on, in a, a car that goes off of a road or I'm on a bike or something that jumps or, or I'm on a surfboard and this wave comes and for some reason I my surfboard won't float and the wave energy is coming over me and I separate from my surfboard and I go up and, you know, or I go off. Some people have these um, dreams where you go off of a a mountainous road in a car, like Thelma and Louise, you know, car car goes off the road and you're in midair. And then I would go out of the car and I'd go up. And um, I had that dream a lot as a kid, but after my NDE, I started uh, remembering where I was going when I would go up and, you know, I would be in these, um, these clinical places, just like my NDE, uh, with, you know, these other worldly beings, um, friendly, joyful, happy beings, um, doing things, um, you know, to some, to, to some ethereal body or something like that. And then they put that body back in bill and then it, you know, it does these healings and things like that. That's what I think the that's what I think the whole program is here. With that's with uh, the alien abductions, you think that they're coming in and like upgrading us and working on us and healing us? Yeah, they're they're keeping uh, David, you know, the avatar, going and maybe change your mind, like. You know, a year or two ago, you decided this podcast thing was very important and you had to do it. Um, And, you know, we're all, we all sort of have these lives that we planned on the other side. And we got free will while we're here for all the little stuff. But, um, yeah, there are things that we wanted to experience or accomplish. And uh, this, it's constantly... Um, kept on track. Wow, that's fascinating. I, I like that theory. Okay, so back to the NDE. You're on the other side. You see these little beings. They've got hoods. I got to go watch Communion now. I got to see what you're talking about. They looked exactly like those beings. And um, I get emails from all over the world. Not a ton of them, but I get them. And it's like one lady said this... These three beings brought my son to me the night before he was born and dropped him off on my body. And it's it's like, that makes sense. You know, they brought the soul in and, um, and that, you know, that's when we come into life uh, just before we're born. And, you know, a lot of those things, one guy said, my grandmother was dying, and she took a long time, and the whole time she talked about these three short little guys that were giggling and dancing around at the end of the bed. And, um, you know, these guys write to me, and they go, you have freaked me out. And I said, yeah, I think we're all supposed to get freaked out a little bit and then um, 
proceed with our awakening as to what's, what we really are. Did you see communion before your NDE or after? I'm curious if that had any influence on your experience on the other side, because we're all, I, th- I feel like all in- NDEs are so unique to the individual. Maybe spirit shows us, they show us things that we can relate to. So I'm, I'm just curious if that's something that you discovered before or after your NDE. Yeah, no, I did not see that movie. I saw the book, uh, you know, in a fire station with the alien face on it. Um, you know, the usual alien face, but I didn't see any of those little guys. And, um, it was just a couple of years ago that I, you know, I'm doing my thing and, um, a lot of us are doing searches and stuff, photos, pictures, and this picture showed up and it was those three guys. And I'm like, what the hell is that? (laughs) And, it zoomed in on it and it's like, it's in this movie. And then I watched the movie and the first time through, you know, you got that, like I said, you got some of those um, musical tones. There's a, there's one called a diminished fifth, you know, like, da 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 da, and it has an effect on us. It grabs mm-hmm. our energy and it takes us on this fear ride. And, you know, these movies are, the soundtracks are full of, this stuff that has an effect on us. And, you know, I'm not saying it's a conspiracy or anything like that. It's just the way it is. And if you turn the sound off and you watch some of these movies there, you don't react as strongly as if, uh, uh, when you keep the sound on and those guys in that movie communion, they never do anything menacing. They, uh, they're very joyful. They're very playful. They're very happy. Uh, they're uh, bouncing around. They're high fiving Christopher Walken. He's dancing around with them. That is exactly the vibe I had uh, in my NDE. Is communion based on a true story, or is it? Yeah, uh... yeah this guy um, Whitley Stryber, something like that, and he had he saw these guys all the time. Um, you know, he alien abductions was the. Uh, was the story. Um, but the movie never does, it never talks about, at the end, at the end, Christopher Walken gets into a, a group therapy thing and some guy says, they're in a ship and they're this and they're, they bring that ship down and Christopher Walken is a really cool line. He goes, a ship? And he, like, you, there's no ship? And, um, you know, to me, that was, it's like, okay, there's a nice clue there. Mm. Um, to lighten up on on the ship thing, I, I, I'm sure there's something going on with UFOs, but um, I don't think I was in a ship. I don't think I was uh, beamed out of there. I think I went. A part of me went into another dimension and was cared for, and then put back. And I think that happens to all of us, all the wow. time. <laughs> That's incredible. That yeah. Like you went somewhere. So what happened next? You're with these beings. Um, what are they saying to you? What are they? They're giggling. They're laughing. Are they talking to you? Are you guys having a conversation? They're sitting right in front of me and um, they're giggling a lot. And as soon as I got my wits about me and they were like going, how was it? What can you tell us? What did you learn? And I was looking pretty perplexed and one of them came over and checked me out i don't know what he was looking at but and he turned to the other two and he goes he doesn't remember us and they all started laughing giggling laughing and you know (laughs) bouncing around like the three stooges and (laughs) you know i think that some of these things this is where they come from and um and so it, it, it wasn't very organized and i was like this is these guys are incredibly lighthearted and uh, not sure what's going on here. And, and then this other guy came out of the background and he was this energetic, uh, tall, wispy guy. And I've called him a lot of things. He looked like a stretched out Gumby or, um, or a walking stick. Um, 
And he had this spinning energy and this, when I say wispy, this, this energy was like coming off of him. And he was like um, this whirlpool. And if you take a glass of water and spin it really fast and then look at that little dancing sliver, mm -hmm. of, that's what he looked like. And when he walked towards me, he had this big smile on his face. His eyes were bright. And when he came towards me, the part, the top would separate just like one of those water whirls. And then the rest would catch up. And it was very bizarre looking. And um, like a little came, tornado almost. Absolutely. Absolutely. And as he came closer, that spinning energy, it engulfed me. And my chest just over pumped and my throat clamped down. And I thought I was going to break down in uncontrollable crying from love. There was so much love coming from this being that it was filling me up and it was uh, paralyzing. It was overwhelming. And he was the sweetest guy. He, um, we went back and forth. And every time I said anything, he chuckled. He was chuckling the whole time. The little guys were giggling. And after a while, I'm watching this and it's like, these guys aren't very productive at all. Um, you know, I was just in, I was just in this incredibly euphoric universe with all of these stars that were obviously, you know, highly developed beings. And I wanted to get back there because that place gave the impression that it was limitless. It was endless. It was limitless. Uh, there were no limitations and you want, you want to, you want a part of that. Um, and so I said, so you guys want to, uh, um, I'm not going to stay here forever. I'm sure. So did you guys want to do a review of my life and we'll get on with it? And did, did you guys want to, uh, start with that? And the tall wispy guy, he just cracked up. He thought that was hilarious. And then the, the little guys were giggling and their whole thing. And, and he said, sure, sure, we can do that if you want. How do you want to start? And I told a bunch of stories. I thought, okay, we're, we're getting somewhere, uh, so I better come up with something. And it was not a traditional profound review of your life where, you know, your words have hurt others and you get to feel that and – um, things like that. It wasn't at all. I was just laying down this rap, you know, about I wish I'd taken this job on this island when we, my wife and I came out of college because she wanted that. She wanted to live on an island by ourselves. But I was in my 20s and, you know, I wanted another fire job. I liked being around the guys and I liked the uh, excitement of fires and the, going on an island was like, seemed to me like I was, it was going to be kind of I told her, I go, it's kind of boring, sweetie. And she, <laughs> but now, you know, I, I'm almost 70 and th that job, I, we would, I would jump at that job. This was 94. Um, there were no podcasts or discussions about NDEs. Had you read like Dr. Raymond Moody's books or anything about NDEs? How did you know about the life review? Well, somebody asked me that. Uh, we all kind of... Um, don't we, we all kind of know that there is, when we die, that our life flashes before our eyes. Okay. Yeah. That goes back to like my grandmother used to say that. For your life sure. will flash, flash before your eyes. And, and that's kind of a review of what went on in your life. So, yeah, I had that concept in my head. And, you know, I, I pulled it, I played that card. Cause gotcha. <laughs> I wanted to get back out in that, you know, it was like being out in the ocean full of, you know, magical purple waves, you know, that other place. And I wanted more of that. You're like, I love how you took control and you're like, hey, let's get on with this. Like, let's do the life review. <laughs> yeah. And, it, you know, it, it was what, why he was laughing is because I was like a toddler and he was like a father. And I can easily see that. I, you know, he's the perfect original, my higher self, uh, we have all kinds of names for it. And I was a copy, a temporary copy. And, you know, I'm coming into this world to have adventures that he's interested in having. 
and um, and he loves me. And you know, when my time's up here, you know, my my um, essence, my soul, will go back into some kind of um, place where he, which is me, uh, can review that for eternity. And it's just this constant learning. That's what we're on. This constant. This constant learning. And, you know, here's another thing. People, sometimes kids, there's a lot of ups, unhappy people today. And it's, you know, you, you can explain it really easy. It's just a disconnect from, you know, the, the earth. We're part of the, the earth, the magnetism and the sun and all that. And, um, but sometimes when people say, when I say, you, you live for eternity and you're in this place where there is no time, no space. Everything is limitless and you can do anything and you live forever. And we don't, when you're in that place, you're not thinking about what happened, you know, years ago or where you're going in life. You're only in the moment. And uh, everything, every new moment is like, oh, wow, this is so cool. (laughs) <laughs> oh wow, this is so cool. This is so and that's all I felt in that you know, in that um star-filled void type thing. Oh wow, this is so cool. You just each new moment was like its own new moment and there weren't any other moments. And you know, we're supposed to strive for that here. Stay in the moment and you know. I like that. Look- that's that's like like the present moment being expanded throughout all eternity over and over again. It's just like, I mean, it sounds amazing. There's this, there's this girl, Louisa Peck. She has an NDE and she's so genuine. Uh, I met her a couple of years ago and um, we're having lunch and she's tell, telling me this story and I was laughing the whole time. She goes, what's so dang funny? And I go, it's like I'm talking to an eight year old. And, uh, and that, that is the key, you know, this genuine, authentic, um, excitement over life, um, over your NDE. And, and she talks when she would say, you know, she flew out into this blue sky and went into this, uh, unending euphoria. That's her NDE. And uh, she's the first one I, I remember that she said, Oh, wow, this is so cool. Oh, wow, this is so cool. And it just was every moment was the same thing. Just this, incredibly stoked um just completely stoked um experience i know it sounds ridiculous but absolutely not no it's it sounds <laughs> exactly right it sounds on point yeah it's that good the news is that good uh about who we are and where we come from um that's what i think i, I don't think there's any um aliens out there as any Death Star or um, anything like that, unless unless you like demons and stuff. I, if you want to conjure them up with your thoughts, they'll come, they'll show up, but um, you don't have to. So, what would you say to people who are like people who hear your experience and they're like, "Hmm, are you sure those weren't demons that you saw?" Because you know there's going to be people listening that be like, oh, that's the devil, you know, people that right. don't what? really fully understand. So what would you say to those people? Well, um, they nobody did anything um, harmful or anything. It was just sweetness and kindness, and you could feel the love coming off all of them. And, um, you know, the big guy, too. It was all, it was all love. Um, I didn't... I was never fearful. I was never worried about anything, even though, you know, it's a pretty bizarre uh, experience um, to talk about. But, no, it was, it was wonderful. And, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a real thing. And I, I told this recently, and... It actually went over. It actually worked. And so the the um, the near-death experience is a real thing. When you're ready, 
um, when your soul's been around for a while, you get an invitation. And most people, you know, it freaks them out and they put it away and it, you know, a lot of people come back from NDEs and they're never the same. They're depressed because you are cut off from that flow, where we come from. And you're back here in this single, this separate, with all these heavy emotions that you have to carry around. And it's devastating. It's like somebody backed a skip loader up and dumped a pile of rocks on you. And you're, and you're stuck underneath it. Um, but when you're ready to take that, that invitation um, and you start relaxing and you don't use, you know, you don't go there. You don't go demons and the devil and somebody's out to get me. Um, nobody can get any of us. We don't die. We live forever. We're indestructible. We just have to realize that. Your current body, you know, you've had thousands of those. Um, but when you, so when you start to realize that this, this is what the real situation here is, then you see it everywhere and you see it in the mainstream. Um, and one, no matter what age you are, everybody can relate to what I'm going to say. And that is, um, in the Wizard of Oz, uh, Dorothy and, um, the name Dorothy it, it translates to gift from God. Uh, Dorothy goes, um, she's in a black and white world and it's drab and people aren't very nice there. They're trying to harm her dog. And um, then the twister comes and, and she's inside the cabin and the cabin, uh, you know, the, this window break comes apart and it hits her in the head and she falls on the bed. And the cabin is, um, you know, this wind is tearing the cabin apart. So she's laying there on the bed. And then there's this scene where this kind of lighter version of her is coming out of her physical body. And then um, she wakes up. The cabin lands uh, somewhere. And she wakes up. And she's in a near-death experience. Uh, this lighter version of her is now the experiencer. And she goes over to the door, and she goes from this drab, black and white, crappy life, and opens a door, it's nothing but beautiful colors, and giant flowers, and everything in the ears talk about this color, and this flow, and this beauty, and it's perfect. And she goes outside, and there's these giggling little munchkins, and they giggle a lot, and they come at her in threes. There's the lollipop guild and the dancers and the politicians. They come three munchkins at a time, come at her, come towards her and do nice things. Uh, and they're very playful, a little um, joyful creatures. And um, Glinda shows up and Glinda flies in and she's this beautiful orb. She's got the colors of purple, and she changes to that changes to green. And if you follow the chakras, you know purple and green. That's divine love. This is a divine loving being, Glenda, uh, Dorothy's higher self. She comes in and greets her and uh, sets her up and sets her up on her journey puts her on the yellow brick road. And uh, when Dorothy needs help, Glenda's always there, uh, pops in whenever the witch, you know, hassles her or whatever. And she goes on her, um, on her way and she gets these three characters, the scarecrow who wants a brain and the tin man who wants a heart and the lion who wants courage. And, so it, clearly to me, and you know, I've just told I've I've just told you my near death experience with the giggling, <laughs> short little playful guys and the, the taller wispy guy and the you know the whole thing with the colorful beautiful orbs um, that have nothing but 
you know, beauty and peace and, and kindness and sweetness. That's all Glenda is, is just this sweet being. And so she's got, she's with the, the scarecrow and the tin man and cowardly lion. And so the, the message I get from this is, and this comes with this whole Kundalini awakening, because I have this story that is ridiculous. Um, the NDE is like 5% of it. But when you're ready to get control of your thinking, to get your mind in that right brain, the, the, the right side of your brain, which is connected to home, it's connected to the divine. Uh, it's music and flow and color and art. And the left brain is here. This is all about facts and figures and what's mine and how can I get more and physical world self. Mm. When you get control of your thinking and connect with that divine mind and make every decision with the intelligence of the heart and proceed in our journeys with courage, without fear, then we get to go home. And there's no place like home. And wow. it's within every one of us. Every one of us uh, has the ability to make that choice to go home. And, and you know, at the end, Dorothy could have gone home anytime. It was up to her to decide. So, pretty cool, huh? That's really cool. I, I've never thought of it that way. Nobody and has. <laughs> it, but it's it makes so much sense. I see all the parallels. Yeah, I mean, down to the the purple and green heart chakra and crown chakra colors. The orb. I didn't even realize that. I don't think I even knew what an orb was when I was a kid, <laughs> you know? Yes. Yeah, but I loved the Wizard of Oz. I used to watch that every single day as a kid. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that it's so. Yeah, when you're, you know, I'm not. I'm not saying it's a conspiracy or anything. There's, you know, there's a divine hand in creativity, and uh, whoever wrote that, you know, one day they said, "Hey, this uh, this looks good. Let's let's put this in the movie," and it all makes sense uh, at this super high level of our understanding. And anyway, so. When you say aliens and that kind of thing, you know, uh, I had my experience and yeah, I was a kook. I was at the top of the kook pile um, for a long time, but I'm not anymore. We all feel this awakening is happening. We all know we're at a crossroads. We all know that we're being prepared for something new. And guys like you, David, you're you're picking up on the message from the other side that says do something about it help step out and, and help others because uh, this is real and you know and we're real we are we really are uh, um, I'm not some happy old guy just trying to make everyone feel good it's a it's the truth um, and it's there it's there in the media when you're ready to see it let's get back to the ND because I unless you were done you were with the beings you you tried getting through the life review. They were giggling and laughing. And then how did you end up back in your body? Like what happened after that? Um, yeah, I told a few stories. And then lack of father, he stepped forward and he goes, okay, that's enough. Time to go back. And it was like I was being picked up off the ground. And uh, I was, you know, going to be put in a car and taken home. And um I was, that blew me away. I was floored because I, 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 Bill had faded really f far. Uh, I wasn't really interested in him at all. I don't think I was even thinking about him. And um, he said, time to go back. And I, you know, I really fought. I said, let's go back. Are you kidding me? I'm not going back there. And there's no way. And he says, yeah, you got to go back. It's, you got things to do and they're important. And he stepped forward, and as he came forward, um, I could feel his intention, his energy, and my vibration was changing. It wasn't so high anymore. It was dropping, and the place started to spin out of control, spin away. 
he evaporated and I dropped away into um, darkness. And I was back near my body. I wasn't back in my body. And I was in this place that did not feel good at all. It was uh, dark and it was lonely. It was dismal. And you didn't want to be there. And it, it was either that I was getting loaded back up with all Bill's energy, um, which we all carry, or I was in this, you know, this other place. We all talk about these. We've got names for it. Um, hell. And whatever it was, it was directly next to where we are in the physical. And, um, yeah, well, absolutely. can you, can you flesh out what that experience was like? Like, I mean, you say hell, did you see like dark entities? Was it more of a feeling? Like, what was that? It was a, it was a crushing feeling of fear. Like you'd just been, you know, a bunch of bricks had just been downloaded onto you. And, you know, that's this. Um, like I said before, the NDE ears, you know, they're in, de some of them are in, in depression for a long time, weeks, months, years. And, you know, they're trying to escape that being downloaded with that feeling again. And, that, you know, this leads to addiction and you can, I have friends have lost 10 years um, with this spiraling sadness of being back here. And so, yeah, that, that it's, it's on purpose the way we, you know, the way things are set up, it's on purpose for us to navigate this place and to get control of our thinking and raise our vibration and to vibrate like wings. You know, we've heard this, we earn our wings and we vibrate out of here by our higher um, vibration, our higher frequency. We don't resonate with it anymore and um, we move into those, you know, those higher realms. What, why do you think you were shown that space? Why do you think you were shown hell? What, what was the learn the lesson in that for you? And um, how did you get out of that back into your body? Well, the, I think the entire lesson of me for me was to, uh, it was like a round trip tour of our circumstance. And, you know, I went from the earth realm being Bill and then I had the NDE and then I was in this heavenly realm, this uh, incredibly expansive place. And I was this different being and, you know, it's kind of a heaven situation. And then I was in this in-between place. You know, they call this the, um, the astral plane, the higher astral, the lower astral. And um, in that, and if you watch the movie, the astral city, which was channeled by this very famous um, guy, his name was Xavier, Chico Xavier. And um, that whole movie is about uh, that there's a heavenly realm that we aspire to. And then there's this in-between place, this astral realm where, you know, we're in this place where we're learning about, um, you know, experiences and having many experiences on earth. And then there's earth where we have our thousands of lives. And then there's the other place that is right next to what we call earth. And, you know, that's, that's right out of religion. You know, that we have to walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Um, and it's a gnarly place. And in that movie, Astral City, there is a gnarly place right next to the physical. And, um, and when I came back from my NDE, that's what I, I felt that place. Um, were you there a long time? Did you have a sense of time while you were there? Were you like, oh my God, am I ever going to leave? Did you feel stuck there at all? Or was it just more of like, oh, I'm looking at it through my window? It was like, I've dropped away and, oh man, where am I now? Oh, this place is heavy. This is gnarly. And then I was back in my body. So it was quick. It was quick and it was horrendous um, Oof. the feeling you know and there that this is this is the place of ghosts you know and uh lost souls um that want to be back in the physical they haven't figured out who they are or what's going on they, they've left this life in a um 
in a fit of uncertainty or astonishment. And you know, that's what that movie, The Sixth Sense, is all about. You, you know, Bruce Willis at the end, he realizes he's a ghost that is stuck thinking he's still alive. And and that's, you know, this this girl, M. M. K. McDaniel, she wrote about this thing where she went, I think it's called Expatriate in Hell or something like that. And um, where she was in a coma for weeks and she was in this hell place for most of that time. And she had no idea that she was, you know, in her spirit form, that she was dead. Um, no idea. The transition is completely smooth. It's a, it's a completely safe uh, trip when we die. And it really is up to us to keep our wits about ourselves on the other side and just sort out these realms. That's what the uh, uh, Tibetan Book of the Dead with those bardos, that's what it's all about. It tells you what you're going to run into, these very bizarre looking beings and to not fear. Ne don't fear them. Once you, once you introduce fear, then, you know, you're going to... What did Tom? Tom Campbell says, once you start a fit of uncertainty, fear is going to be the first stop. And once you start that fear thing, you know, our minds, we, we are creators and we will create a hell realm <laughs> with our own thoughts. I know this mm. gets really bizarre, but that's what MK McDaniel, that's what she came up with. She went through this thing for weeks, this hellacious um, experiences. And she, one day she put her foot down and she started singing some religious song that she sang in church and everything changed. She popped right out of hell um, by changing her thoughts. Coming back now, um, but you gave me the impression that you didn't talk about it or you were afraid to talk about it for years. Did you try telling friends? Did you try telling family or did you just hold it in? No, as, uh, as, so back to my NDE, I'm back in my body and I can, uh, I can wake up for a few minutes and look at the machines, you know, and I can see my vital signs are climbing in the dark and, but I can't stay awake very long. And then some point just before sun, sunrise, I could stay awake and, um, nurse walked by and sh she's like, you're awake. And I said, yes, I am. And she goes, I got to go tell the doctor. And I said, I need, to, I need to talk to you. And she goes, we have been, you have been the special case all night. We didn't know how you got so far gone. What is, was going to happen to you? Um, you know, it was just wait and see type thing. And, you know, they, they figured I might be brain dead or, um, cause I was out for 12, 13 hours, something like that. Just gone. Wow. Hardly any vital signs. And uh, she goes, I need to go tell the doctors. And I said, okay, you can go tell doctors. But first, you know, I, I, wanted, I wanted to voice this. I was like, what am I doing back here? I was pissed. I was like, I was home. I was home with my best friends and I loved it. How did I get back here? I had bought the farm. I was convinced of it. And she said, she put her hands on my shoulders. She was this old nurse, very sweet. And uh, she said, honey, you've been in escrow, but you fell out of escrow and now you're back with us. And she looked me in the eye and she said, you're going to have to get your head around that. And, you know, this was a, this was a soul that had just returned to this place. And I got grounded. I, she connected with me at some level and I'm like, okay, I get it. And it was, that was a real blessing um, because a lot of NDEers, they ears, they never get grounded. They, um, they walk around wondering what happened to them. They can't talk to anybody. And if they try, nobody understands. You, you just, uh, you, you're just a bigger, you know, weirdo with every time you try. And, you know, this is devastating to the soul that's inside who knows what happened and, and know something about this place and our place in it. And they have to, um, have nowhere to go with it. And, um, anyway, she told me that she grounded me and 
she went and got the doctors, and I was just like, blah, 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 blah. You know, the, there was a tall, wispy guy. There were these three little guys, and they were so funny, and I've known them forever. And, you know, it was this wild, uh, we have no idea what we are. And, you know, he says, oh, you're crazy. He brought all his friends in, and they all had a good laugh. And um, my family showed up, and I was like, you know, my mom and dad and my wife, and I'm just like, same thing. Talk, 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 talk. And you could just see that, uh, you know, disappointment on their faces that their son has gone crazy. Oh. And, and then, you know, I was on the, I was on the couch for about a week and I had a lot of um, funny things happen, but I got back to work and everybody had heard, you know, uh, Letson had this thing happen to him and he went somewhere and, you know, everyone hospital was talking about it and the guys were, word was leaking around. So guys would come up to me and they're like, dude, well, I heard you had this thing happen. What happened? And I'd tell them. I'd just, I'd let it loose. And um, I wouldn't hold anything back. And, you know, this went on for a couple of weeks. And one of the guys, you know, a friend from the office said, hey, you know, the chief's up at the office. They're talking about you. And, um, and the message was, you know, we're not going to have lunatics, you know, riding our uh, fire engines. And... Um, and I got that. I absolutely got it. And I'm like, okay, yeah, that's fair. I, I get it. And so I zipped it, and um, and I dummied up for 15 years until I retired, and then um, it came back with uh, like a storm, and I went looking for answers. And we, you know, we get into shamans and ayahuasca and uh, ancient knowledge, and you know, all the way back to. Atlantis, and it's a wonderful story. Um, it's all of our story. Absolutely. But, I, I'm like, well, my heart breaks for you that you had to, that that happened. I mean, that's, you have this big expansive experience, and then now it's like you're being shut down. Um, but I'm glad you've made a full circle and kind of come back around to it. So that leads me to my next question. You, your discovery of ayahuasca. Um, how did that happen? Was that because of your NDE? What led you on that journey? Well, okay, I'll answer that question. But uh, the um, something I didn't say was, and I think maybe it was part of your first, your last question. But it was like, how did you handle psychologically? How did you handle this NDE coming back? And now you can't talk about it, uh, and that's the problem. For it, maybe not so much now. But that was a problem for everyone I've known. Um, my my whole group that was having these things happen in the seventies, eighties, nineties. And what I can honestly say, the the reason that it was cool was, you know, I'd been somewhere that's astonishing, and I was no longer Bill, and um, I really wasn't taking uh, Bill's needs or his um, reaction none of it I didn't take any of it seriously you know his uh, his judgments and things like that I, it was like I know who this guy is this is a temporary guy who's going to react to things and I don't need to do that and you know not this is wisdom for all of us you don't need to react to the temporary avatar that you are so, yeah, I had to dummy up and, you know, I was a, in the ears were uh, kooks. I was one of them. In fact, I was, my story, I was at the king of the mountain of the kook pile, you know, and because uh, mine was very strange, still is. Um, but I wasn't reacting to, uh, you know, Bill's predicament or the circumstances of this life or the, the times we live in. It was like, okay. That's the way it is, and I know better. You know, this is a this is a this is a, a ride we're on, and I don't have to take it seriously, and I don't have to take me seriously. Um, and that's how I proceeded, and yeah, I, I was lucky. So yeah, in, in two thousand and ten, I retired, and I was a happy go lucky retiree, um, playing in bands and riding bikes and running and swimming and jumping and playing. And 
that went on for a year or two. And then um, sitting downstairs watching a movie in the afternoon. And this movie came up, DMT, The Spirit Molecule by Rick Straussman. And so, you know, I never looked at anything like that, drug stuff. You know, I hung out with cops and stuff. But what the hell, you know, it's Netflix. Put it on and... I liked Straussman. It was completely weird stuff. I'd never heard of any of this stuff before. But I liked Straussman. He had this sort of uh, authentic, like like he knows what he's talking about. There's something here with this guy. Um, and, and he was a, a doctor for the Mexico University. And he did um, a study where he injected 70 volunteers with... Um, DMT, dimethyltryptamine, uh, which is what we make in our um, pineal gland, and uh, it drops a little bit on, on our brain every night, and that's you know that's the soul travel. We we leave our bodies and we start that REM sleep, and then we're you know we're actually traveling in other dimensions. And at the time of death, it splashes the brain with a huge dose and rockets the soul out of the body. And, um, and I watched the movie and I liked him. So I bought the book, you know, came up on Amazon. Why don't you buy this book? You know, how these platforms interact with each other. Cause I just watched the movie. And so I never done that before, but I bought the book and, um, it was it's written so well and he's so good at describing things. And when I got to chapter 13 and 14 called contact through the veil, where his volunteers were, you know, going on this 10, 15 minute out of body blast. You know, they're blasted out of their bodies with that um, intravenous DMT. And they found themselves in a, a clinic and there were three short little beings there and a taller guy in the background that was seemingly in charge. And it was light. And it was fun and they were comical. And when I read that, I I dropped that book and I walked around for a week going, what, what is going on in this place we live? Um, because I had my thing and, you know, I learned to put it away and I knew it was real. And I got some solace from the Tolle, you know, Eckhart Tolle books and some others. But here was this guy who was, you know, my thing was my thing, but here was this guy who was recreating that for anybody. And most of his volunteers were going to the same place and seeing the same beings. And most of them were having, you know, they were saying good things about it, that it was light and it was fun and they were supportive and, some of them said, you know, uh, they were told, you're doing it wrong. Um, you know, because, you know, that that dose of DMT is, you are yanked out of your body and into the, ne the next place. And what we're supposed to do is we can do the same thing through, um, you know, what the, um, the gurus do is, uh, you know, meditation and years and years and years, you can train yourself to move in these dimensions. And, but yeah, they were hearing from the entities, the beings on the other side, they were hearing things like you're doing it wrong or you're not supposed to be here. Wow. <laughs> and, and, um, and so I, you know, I read that book through completely through twice and I sat down and I said, well, you know, there's all, the only thing I can come up with is this is the most important book that's been written in the last 10,000 years um, because there is a doorway to the other side and the ND ears, you know, they go through their traumatic thing and they see it. And the people who drink uh, ayahuasca, you know, they, with the shamans, they go to the other side and they see it. And, um, and these deep meditators that go into a trance, you know, deep trance where your body seems to, fall away like a pile of rocks and now you're floating in some other space. Um, they go there and, and they, and they see it, they experience these other dimensions. 
But, you know, Straussman was step right up, set you up with an IV, give you this DMT, boom, you're there. You know, there. it's uh, it's hard to believe, but there is a doorway um, to where we go. And anybody can go there. I don't recommend the DMT uh, thing. And we'll talk about the ayahuasca thing um, also. But, um, you know, I, I'm a guy that's almost 70. And so I recommend um, the whole thing with meditation and slowly um, getting yourself tuned to where you can experience those, you know, through diet through how you think, through structured water, um, you know, like the yogis. That's what a yo- That's what the whole thing with yo- yoga and the yogis is about, is um, fine-tuning yourself so that you're uh, available for, the, for that doorway. Absolutely. So- and, you know, plant medicines are not for everybody. Um, they're not for everybody, and they're it's, – it's, ayahuasca is, is work. I mean, it is not something that you take for fun. It is – you're doing the work and uh, it's, it's something to be taken seriously and you, you have to feel called if, if you're going to do it and be ready for it mentally and physically. Yeah. True statement. And uh, you know, the shamans that I was around at Taito Juanito, uh, he's out of Colombia. Um, this guy is a, a, just a legend to sweetheart, all the guys that work with him. And then down in Pachamama, the, um, you know, the village that, Tiohar is a chief and all his guys, they, they do the plant medicine and, um, they absolutely know what they're doing. They're all, they're all sweethearts and they'll take good care of you, but it's a doorway and you're, you're going into a room that you better be sure you've been invited. Uh, and you've done the work like David says, um, and prepared yourself because, it's really not believable. <laughs> it's magic. It made me believe in magic. Um, it is a portal to the other side. Uh, what now that you've experienced both? In, no, now that you've had an NDE and uh, experienced psychedelics, uh, ayahuasca, DMT, um, how did how are they similar? Did you notice any similarities, or you know, did you were you able to like communicate or find the the beings through the ayahuasca? Yeah, that was um, the first time I drank it. I didn't know what I was doing. You know, reading the book, I went on this quest. It took a couple of years before I felt comfortable. But I was just down in Costa Rica all the time, for weeks and months at a time. And um, and I ended up at this place, and they said, we got this pavilion out in the jungle in Taitawanita. It'll be here in a few weeks. And I'm like, yeah, I want to do that. This is something I'm supposed to be seeking, you know. And um so yeah, they they had this drink called yahe, and it's extremely um, thick, and it was several gulps. It's a you know the those guys, those Colombian shamans are called tiger shamans um, because you're going to get ripped out of your body uh, at one of those ceremonies, and you um, there's nothing <laughs> there's nothing gentle about it. Uh, <laughs> And so, yeah, I, I drank one night and I thought it was all folklore and fun and games. But at the same time, there was this thing about DMT and it had something to do with um, completely led, I believe, completely led to have the experiences I had um, and to be here today talking about it. Um, so, yeah, I drank it and then there's this hour, uh, it takes about 45 minutes, an hour where you could feel the the medicine going to work on your system. It was like you were getting punched in the stomach, like there was activity in your liver, and then you felt things in your kidneys. And I asked about it, and they said that the my, medicine is going, and it's collecting all this um, bad energy, this dark energy, and it's bringing it to your stomach, and you're going to expel it. And um, I was like, oh, okay, Um didn't really believe that but after about 45 minutes i was sitting there and there was this huge like the roof of the pavilion went away and there was this huge like um 
spiraling DNA thing with incredible colors. And it was um, slowly spinning, going out into the stars. And all these lights I've never seen before, these colors, <clears throat> excuse me. There was this rose-colored, uh, incredible color and another tangerine color. They were streaming down through this um, this giant spiral. And you didn't want to look away. It was just going right through your forehead. And um, that kind of freaked me out because I'd never done anything like that. I mean, I drank beer. Uh, <laughs> I didn't, didn't smoke any anything. I didn't use any drugs at all. And suddenly I went to this gnarly, uh, this, 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 this gnarly, what do they call it? Psychotropic, uh, um, drug. And, and I was in this incredible, um, psychedelic situation. People want to call it a hallucination, but it, it, I think it's a, a reality, a nation. It's not, you're not hallucinating, you're not dreaming something up. It's there. It's yeah. just, coming, it's just coming through. And so I, w I rolled on my side and I was trying to, you know, I was starting to moan and, and, and move around and stuff. And, my, and I was thinking, I have really screwed the pooch tonight. Um, Cause it was just starting and it was going to be going on for the next four or five hours. And, um, right at, um, an hour, I found myself over my bucket and I purged and it was like a jet engine. It was just this roaring sound. Um, it scared the people around me, it was a super roaring sound. And what I saw was this bluish black, like it was like a gel or smoke or vapor or it was it wasn't of this world that we know and it went into the bucket and then it came out of the bucket and and it spread across the floor of the pavilion and i looked around at my friends and i'm like what is happening <laughs> uh, you know this all this came out of me um and the shaman saw it and he told his guys go over there and sweep this whole area out into the jungle and it's you know, it's this, it's this energy. It's this, um, you know, emotional baggage, um, maybe from several lives. I don't know. As, as a fireman, you see a lot of tough things and it could be that that's, that was it. You know, there was a lot of, you know, kids in car accidents and things like that. It, a lot of that was stored up, uh, possibly. But, um, oh. yeah, it, it went out and, um, and Terrence McKenna writes about, uh, in his book, True Hallucinations, he talks about these Ecuadorian shaman who, when they drink ayahuasca, they purge this bluish black vapor liquid, uh, thing. And that the shamans are so accomplished that they will collect it. And they will spread it out on the floor and they will look at it and look at other times, other like a TV screen. And that makes sense. These, these events were, you know, captured in, and you could, you could watch it. Uh, I know I'm sorry. It's unbelievable <laughs> to almost everybody, but uh, no, that's it. I, it, it's total. I, I'm so with you on this. I, I'm fascinated by it because I've seen some stuff, you know, in ceremony myself, but not like that. Um, but that's, yeah, I believe it. And it's pretty cool that your shaman saw it as well. I mean, you saw it and he saw it. Like, it just it's validation that, yeah, the energy was there in the room. Go sweep it out into the jungle. Get it out of here, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And they they call it a healing ceremony because of that. You. You get this energy out of your body, out of your energy. And, um, you know, that's demonstrated for us in that movie, The Green Mile, where that big black guy, you know, uh, Coffee, John Coffee, mm -hmm. uh, anybody who's got a problem, he, he takes and then he purges it out. That's right. And, yeah. You know, that, to me, that's Hollywood telling us, 
this is real. <laughs> this is a real yeah. thing. And um, yeah, That's and that right. energy, you know, we carry enough of that energy around and it makes us physically ill. And, you know, he, John Coffey saves the warden's wife or something. Um, and she looks and appears fine in the morning and she was on her deathbed. Um, cause he, and he pulled this tremendous amount of energy out of her and, um, cast it off. So yeah, this, our, our conversation is running off the rails here, but, um, uh, you're good. With no, it. I'm totally good with it. I mean, this is, this is part of our experience. This is your experience and it's a lot of people's experience and, um, I've had my own experience. So yeah, there's something there. Um, and it's fascinating to say the least, <laughs> you know, and, and that was just the beginning of my night. And, um, I was in an agony, um, for hours rolling on the ground and moaning. And, uh, you know, like you talked about, you try to make it to the restroom. You're, I was really dizzy and, um, felt like you had the flu. Um, and I wasn't ready for that. I didn't know I was going to have this drunken dizziness. Um, but so you, the way I could, the, what I was experiencing was, um, there was me, the guy that's always been in charge of Bill, you know, that guy, that thinking being, and then there was this sweet, um, higher self, this sweet soul and higher self. And there was like this, I was trying my hardest. Um, Bill was trying his hardest to stay in control and he wasn't no longer in control for a few hours. He was basically uh, tied and gagged and put in the trunk and, you know, this higher self, this, um, Hire you is in charge, uh, is driving. And you're in the trunk just kicking and screaming and putting up a fit. And at one point, one of the guys came over, uh, Leonardo. He came over and I went through all kinds of ridiculous stuff going on. They were helping me with the, with the, um, you know, with the palm fronds and the blow. And, um, and he said, at some point you're going to have to find the courage to surrender to the softer voice. And mm -hmm. I said, okay, that's what I need to do. And they put me back on uh, my spot and I just w did the counting thing. And within 15 minutes, it was complete bliss. It was utter euphoria. And it was similar to the, um, my NDE when I found myself flying in that euphoric space, that it was that much um, joy. Um, and there was, it was so powerful that I was bouncing on the ground and I was trying my hardest to hang on uh, to being in my body because every atom in me wanted to go home. And, you know, it had the, the path was there. The ayahuasca opens that path to that divine self. And yeah, I had incredible um, vibrations to where I was bouncing and I had to do my best to, just to hang on. It, it was, it was weird because uh, I wanted to just peel away from my body. And so. I get that for sure. Yeah. And then it was, and then in the, you know, as the sun started to come up, coming back, everyone else is coming back. And I was like, as soon as I had my wits, I was talking to the shaman. I'm like, man, how did you guys do that? That was so cool. And, uh, cause I was, you know, somebody else, somebody you want to be. Uh, I was without all of, you know, the baggage that Bill, um, carries around and you know there were other guys there that went as far and they were uh devastated they were you know huddled oh. in a blanket and they were in a corner in a blanket and they looked like they were shell-shocked 
And, you know, the, the shaman and the, the guys were like, I was high five and I'm, I'm like, you guys are gnarly. You know, you could do that to me. And, uh, and what, what an incredible, uh, experience. And, you know, I wasn't upset about what had happened. I, I'd seen it before with the NDE and, you know, it was, it was, it was, it was a similar thing. Um, so I was psychologically, it, it didn't hit me, but it's a huge number. It's like 90% or something. Um, take a long time before they think about doing that again, because it's, um, it can be so devastating. It doesn't yeah. sound like you were, you were in the devastating pile. For the most part, I see ayahuasca as going home. It is my like a family reunion for me because my ancestors come through. Um, I have these amazing experiences and I love purging. I love what they call, they, they say getting well because you're getting rid of all that stuff that's in your, your body, the trapped energies, the toxins and stuff. And uh, I, when I purge, I'm just like, yes, it's get it out. Like get it out of me. Um, and it just feels so cleansed afterwards and that you, that euphoric feeling that you're saying, um, but that ayahuasca is just so ancient and mysterious and magical and has connected me to the spiritual realm in ways that I never even imagined before. Do you have any any final thoughts, any final words that you want to leave the audience with? Um, yeah, um, right now the, the NDE is the um, it's kind of the popular thing, but... Um, you know what that what that's really pointing to is the pineal gland and this DMT um, release at um, the time of death, and you know that goes. You know all these ancient, advanced cultures they knew all about this and they used it in ceremony, and that's what the shamans are a holdover from. You know the Egyptians and um, the Mayans and. So it, it'll it, it leads to that that there's a connection there, and you can do the same thing with meditation, and this is why this is being uh, stressed. This is where you know the civilization is supposed to go to realize that you can reconnect with the earth, um, with your lifestyle, and you can by sitting quietly and letting go, you can achieve those same realms. Um, through meditation and through stillness and silence. Um, so that's, I guess that's my words of wisdom. How did your NDE impact your life? Did you, did you notice any like major changes from the bill that walked into this experience versus the, the bill that walked out of the experience? Yeah, he, the bill that, you know, I've aged 30 years. But, um, you know, that the bill before the NDE, his, he was a rascal. Um, and he, he had some side of him that was, you know, competitive and um, things like that. And that guy, after the NDE, that guy slowly packed his bags. And sometime in my mid-40s, my wife's like, who are you? You're not even close to the a-hole I married. And... She says you're you're so sweet, and uh, I go I don't know I don't you know, and this this leads to this whole thing with Kundalini and um, this energy connecting back to where we come from, and you become more like your higher self than you are uh, your physical um, avatar. That guy starts packing his bags, and you start acting like a some kind of cool guy. And and that happened to me slowly after my NDE, and and I think it's because I took the invitation. Um, uh, it didn't rock my world. I I saw it as it was something cool. And then when the time came when I was retired, I said, "All right, let, let's go find out what happened here." And you know, it takes a lot of huevos to sit. <laughs> You know, I, I respect you to sit in those ceremonies and come through it unscathed. Uh, <laughs> that's not 
you know, normal for a Westerner because we have no idea um, how big we really are, how immense we are, you know, who we really are. And so, yeah, you did, you're doing good, David. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you. Thank you, Bill. And I know uh, there, you you said earlier about Kundalini and you're like that there was this amazing experience that you had and you're like, the NDE is only 5% of the conversation. And we kind of skipped past that. And I don't know if, if you wanted to like squeeze that in or maybe we save it for another time, but there was something there I felt. Yeah, it's a it's a wild story. And so, yeah, I, I, was, I kept going down to um, Costa Rica and I drank ayahuasca in a handful of settings. And the next time I showed up, the shaman says, we're going to give you less. Um, because I was so, I mean, I'm moaning on the ground and drooling and farting for hours in just, just <laughs> waves of, waves of, uh, terror, you know, uh, and I would sit there and think, what am I so upset about? I couldn't even, um, I couldn't put my finger on it, but, uh, yeah, it's a, that's a wild night. And so I yeah I went back a, a couple more times with them and he said that you are a brave man through a translator because um, I was back in six months and I didn't take it serious the first time and so yeah I did a lot of prep and then the next times it was uh, always blissful you know the grids and um, and the movies you know you find yourself in these scenes with family that has passed on and. Um, crazy stuff. Like you're in a movie and you're watching it, but you're also in it. And so, yeah. So I went back several times and then I kind of fell in love with this place, Pachamama, and the way they ate and the way they were in silence. And they have all these um, sort of workshops. And so I was doing the workshops and one of them, there was this, we would do this eye gazing uh, thing. Have you ever heard of that? Where you sit in a semi dark room and look at your partner and just go eye on eye when you get that locked on thing. And um, this went on for like this eye gazing thing. It went on for like three days and you kept changing partners every 20 minutes or something. And we'd all, we're in silence, but we'd all eat together. And at night we'd all sleep out in the jungle on these mats and, it's a. It was just an awesome, you know, tearing down, stripping down the um, personality you think you are. And so this had gone on for uh, several trips. And then I was uh, on this particular trip. I noticed I um, was in the meditation temp, uh, meditation hall. It's a big hall. About 300 people are in there and silence for an hour and a half every night. And I noticed that there was this, uh, bluish purplish um, light or energy and it was going up the walls and coming back down and it was in a five second repeat where it was just going wow and I'm, I was lo- looking going what the hell is somebody playing with the lights and um, this went on for a couple nights and then I was in this eye gazing thing and I noticed my partners, I could see their aura. I could see colors around them. And, um, and it was, it was wild. And the the colors were fitting to the person's mood. I could, this one old guy was just loved everybody. And he just had this brilliant purple all around him. And, and this other young guy, he was kind of a hothead and it was red. It's a reddish black, you know, he was always ready to fight, you know, or argue or, and I'm like going, this is really cool. And people started asking me what colors I saw and stuff. And and I, you and I talked about this earlier, about this stream of, you know, a person would walk by and they would have this gold light going straight up with all these columns of different colored lights inside this gold light. And it was dancing on the top and the back of their head. Wow. And and it would go up and, you know, like a, like an old um, chimney sweep hat, you know, it'd go up several feet up 
and then it would disappear into the ceiling. Like, you know, you've heard this thing about the um, puppet master that were that were puppets, you know, and were being um, downloaded as to changing our mind and things like that. And there's a good there's a movie that's good on that. It's called The Adjustment Bureau um, with Matt Damon, and you'll actually see these um, these guys with these helmets. You know, it's like the sh the short little hooded guys I saw. It's a similar. You know, they're like technicians, and they're and we're working on us, changing our mind. And um, so yeah, those things happened. And then I was in this this eye gazing thing and the lights were low and we changed partners. And all of a sudden this, this German guy were looking and all of a sudden the parts of his face just started rearranging like a Picasso and just parts were, mo were moving all around. And I, I was looking at him and I'm going, what the hell? And, <laughs> and, and then it would all like kind of get together and a boom, there was a new face. And it was like a projection over his face. I could still see his face behind um, this, but there was a person there and he'd have a different expression and, you know, it would stay for one or two seconds. And, and it was like watching the pages of a book just turn. And then there would be a new face. And sometimes they'd be alarmed that I was looking at him and sometimes they'd be happy. And sometimes they'd be talking uh, almost frantically. And um, my buddy, you know, we uh, we were on a break and my buddy goes, what's going on? Everyone's talking about it. And I'm like, everybody I look at, I see faces, dozens of faces. And he goes, well, look at me. And so we got off in the dark and I looked at him and I go, and it came right up. And I'm like, dude. And he goes, what do you see? And I go, there's this guy. And he's just talking frantically and it's like well find out what he has to say <laughs> <laughs> so i was like really close to him looking right at this guy and he's just like well you know he had he had some story about his life and um you know he died in some sort of confused state and uh that's what was imprinted on my friend in that life um so that's wild bill were you on had you guys had ayahuasca or were you completely sober when the completely sober i had I, that was like in oh. 2000 2013 and 14 was the ayahuasca kind of run and then uh 15 16 17 was i was just going down there you know my wife was ready to divorce me i i was just wanted to be in that jungle because it's a blue zone and it's completely clean and it's just open and yeah. There were so many things happening that, you know, as soon as you come back to the States, it's like somebody throws a horse blanket on you energetically. Um, and that's why stuff like I'm saying sounds so bizarre is because we're, we're, you know, we're cut off in human form, but we're really cut off uh, in the West or in the States. I don't know. But, but yeah, yeah. it was, it was cool. And it was, um, you know, I could tell one story after another about all this cool stuff that happened. But at one in one time, my buddy, he got addicted to this. So he we did it for uh, several times um, during the week. And I would tell him the people that I saw. And one night, this really uh, scarred up, ugly looking guy would show up. And he didn't look happy. And... And then he'd disappear and then some other faces would show up, you know, past lives, ordinary people. And then this guy would push his way through. And it's like, man, he, he looks even more pissed off than the last time. You know, he was all scarred up and bald head and like some kind of old warrior. And, um, and then the third time he came through, I was like, all right, this isn't going to go good. And, um, I, you know, this guy's going to take charge of the situation and my buddy's gonna, you know, physically attack me. And just when I was thinking, okay, this is what I'm gonna do. I'll cover up and I'll roll over on the couch if something happens and then he'll get control. And just when I thought that my buddy goes, dude, we have to stop. I've got this overwhelming urge to beat the crap out of you. And, oh my God. 
And, <laughs> and I'm, like, I'm like, I totally saw it. I totally saw it. And he's like, you saw what? And I'm like, you got a guy that lived, you know, that's a soul that's on your, on your energy. And he was a mean son of a gun. And, um, I could tell he hated me. He wanted to kick my ass. And I figured, and he goes, I couldn't hardly control it. I just wanted to wail on you and, uh, strangle you. And, and I'm like, yeah. And he goes, well, we got to set up some boundaries <laughs> with this. <laughs> but you oh know, my everybody's, God. everybody's got, everybody can do this. And there's this guy on Jeff Mara. His name was Lake Flacco or something like that. But he talks all about this eye gazing. Um, I can't think of his name, dang it. But I'll send something to you, David. Dang. Yeah, send it to me. Um, so you had this ability to see this while you're in, in Costa Rica. Have you seen anything here in the States? Have you had any like of these gifts come through seeing auras or anything like that? Or is that just, does that stay in the jungle for you? No, that's, that's here. Um, it's full time. I can in the grocery store and stuff. You just, really? you know, yeah, you kind of do that thing where you put your, you put your attention here, you know, let your eyes go and you know what I mean? Just center it in your brow or something and you can see a person's aura. We can all do it. We're, we're just cut off from it. And you'll see faces. Um, I'll see faces change. Um, okay. Not everybody can, I'm sure has access to that. Like you do though. Like I, I've tried to see auras and maybe sometimes I think I see them, but I've definitely not seen faces. I don't know if that's a very common thing that people are going to see faces or, you know, imprints of others past lives on them, but that's pretty cool, man. That's like, that's next level stuff. Yeah. I'll send you this thing, uh, this guy. Cause you know, you're kind of, I was kind of on my own. I tell this at an IONS meeting or something, you know, with the experiencers group and they would, half of them would, you know, gasp like, <gasps> <laughs> And I'm like, okay, well, this, uh, this is kind of uh, ahead of the game here somehow. But um, but then this guy came on, Jeff Mara, and, you know, he looks like a wizard. And he talks all about this eye-gazing thing and how he does it and how it's easy to do. And uh, it was really reassuring. Um, and he goes really, I mean, he's, he goes really far and, you know, the he says the two people are connecting on this other energetic level and both he and this guy he was eye gazing with suddenly found themselves in like the 1800s in a farmhouse in Kansas or something watching this whole scene and wow that, that freaked them out it all freaked them all the way out and oh you know, that's cool you know, this story about everything's happening at once and we have all these multiple lives and all these multiple timelines. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, you can, I, they jumped them. They jumped one of them and they both went to the same thing. And um, so, yeah, he's a, that's a good story about the eye gazing thing and the faces changing. And, Dang. and it, it started, you know, the, the blue, um, the blue um, energy that was going up and down the walls, I later found out talking to these guys at this conference. The, uh, this guy gave this talk about gravitational waves and how NASA has these places with these miles long tunnels with mirrors and, and um, laser, laser beams. And every now and again, there's a glitch in the matrix and it passes through these um, – gravitational wave stations and they can record it. And I asked this guy, I go, I, I said, well, what's the frequency of these waves? And he goes, well, it's just like, wow, you know, it's like constantly going. And, um, and NASA, uh, you know, is, is reading them and uh, they're looking at this place in the sky, the, the Pleiades, the Orion's belt. And that's the same place that, uh, you know, the Giza Plateau that the 
Sphinx and the Great Pyramids, they're all looking at the same place, this Orion's belt. <laughs> and if you talk to UFOers, they'll, you know, they, they have beings that meet with them and stuff, and they say their homes are, you know, the Pleiades. The, yeah. The Pleiadians, you know, they talk about this. Yeah. So all these people are looking at the same place in the sky, and there's this readable gravitational wave of energy that's coming down here. And um, uh, hopefully I'm not going too far. But what, what, what I believe, because when I look in, in the sky at night, I see aurora borealis. I see purple and green waves rolling. And if you go, and this is something everybody can do, if you go up to the Arctic Circle and chase the aurora, get underneath it. Um, it's a wonderful night. Um, get out in the snow and get underneath that strong aurora. You'll see this, these lights and coming out of the sky, uh, raining down on you. And it's like, it's like these gravitational waves are carrying this signal, this purple and green signal, this signal of divine love. And inside it is all this information carried in color that is organizing our movie or the play that we're all in. And um, that's the way I see it. Because if I just sit still for a few minutes, everything's swirling and, you know, it looks like I'm in a, a snow globe of glitter. This is, these are all conscious beings, you know, the, that's what our, our world is made up of consciousness. Absolutely. I know. I, I, it's really far out there. Um, but we're, we're all move, we're moving back to this understanding that we're just clueless. That's all. That's why we're so unhappy. Uh, we're clueless. Our, our ancestors are all around us. We've never lost anyone. Mm -hmm. Our pets, um, you know, they're all interacting with our energy, folding in between uh, their, yeah. Yeah. I believe it. I, I definitely believe it. it. It's just, it's, it's easy to get wrapped up in our circumstances and our story and to, you know, forget, you know, uh, to forget all of that. We're not tapped in anymore. And so that's why I like having these conversations and why I'm glad that you were able to share over two hours of your time with me to help me, <laughs> you know, come back to center and remember who I really am. So thank you so much, Bill. I really, really appreciate you taking time and sharing your story. Yeah, you're welcome. My pleasure. Keep up the good work. You're, you're a stud, bro. Uh, thanks, man. We'll talk soon. Okay. All right. See you later. Take care.